Well, I thought I'd take a few minutes over here at the pond and talk to you guys about aeration. I see a lot of folks online uh, with questions about aerators, and uh, I thought I'd maybe chime in and, and show you what I've got going on, and maybe it'll give you some ideas of what you could what you could try with your pond. Because I feel like I have the pretty typical Midwestern pond here. I'm in uh, southeastern Indiana, and this is a half acre pond with uh, very little contour to the bottom, just nice, uh, easy slope in the bottom. It's about 10 feet deep at the very deepest when the pond is full. Um, so I feel like I've got a your your typical Midwestern small pond, and this is what I'm doing for aeration. Now you can see that we are, we're actually about three feet low right now. We had an extremely dry summer last year, so I'm waiting on spring rains to fill the thing back up. But I've got two styles of aeration in the pond here. Um, the first style, and my, my, uh, the one that I rely on the most, is a bottom diffuser electrical pump style. So I have electric at my barn, 600 feet away and I don't have any electric out here to the pond. It was much cheaper for me to run 600 feet of air hose out here than it was to run 600 feet of electrical line and put an electrical outlet out here. So that's what I did. A few years ago when I decided I needed aeration in my pond, I rented a trencher and I bought 600 feet of air line and it trenches from the barn, which I'll show you here in a little bit. We'll, we'll go over and, and check out what's going on in the, pond, in the barn trenched a line over here to this this box and under that lid and I just tried to pop it up I didn't bring a screwdriver with me I can't get it open um, the it's an inch and a half irrigation line is what I'm using it stops here and it tees there's a T fitting with ball valves on each side that go into my aerator my diffu my uh, weighted diffuser lines so there are two small diameter lines that come out of this box and you can see the remnants of the trench where I actually trenched them in underwater because I didn't want them I didn't want my lines exposed at all above ground so they come over here and I pull them out in the winter time I pull my diffusers out and then I coil up the lines where they come out of the ground here and I keep them under this bucket so those are the two weighted lines um, so those go out in the, in the spring, I'll place them again and I'll place them out here, which is about, I'll put it about, it'll be about eight feet deep here. And then the other one will be over here at the very deepest point and that'll be about 10 feet deep. And I'm able to, with those ball valves, adjust the amount of flow to get an equal amount of airflow to each one, because this one will be a little shallower, the pressure will be less on this one so it tends to the air tends to want to come out this one and not so much out this one so if i adjust my ball valves i'm able to get equal pressure distribution and equal air distribution to the two diffusers so in addition to that aeration system we also have a windmill i only rely on the windmill as uh, something to keep the ice off in the winter time, just to keep a hole in the ice for, you know, transfer of gases out of the water into the water, that sort of thing. It's good to keep a hole in your ice for, you know, the health of the pond. So because in the summertime when I need the aeration in the pond, and if you can picture a hot stagnant August day, when you really need aeration in your pond, that windmill is not turning. So I can't rely on the windmill to aerate the pond and circulate the water in the hot summer months when I really need it. So we just rely on the windmill. You can see the bubbles coming up there. We just rely on the windmill in the winter time to keep a hole in the, in the ice. Because the windmill won't overcome uh, the head pressure, I can't put it 10 feet deep. That stone is only about three feet deep right now, and if, it, if I go any deeper than about five or six feet, it won't make bubbles at all. It, won't, it doesn't have the pressure to, to go as deep as I'd like to. So that's why it's as shallow here on the edge as it is. Um, 
So that's the, that's the windmill. And let's go over to the barn and I'll show you what I got going on with the electrical pump in the barn and talk about, you know, all that. Well, here we are 600 feet away. I'm standing in my barn and the, the air line from the pond, from the bottom diffusers come through that clearing. It, I dug a ditch using a, a trenching machine that I had rented and you can kind of see the remnants of the trench. Comes up here and we follow it under and it comes out here. This is inch and a half poly uh, line that's similar to, similar to the black plastic water line, but this is actually for, uh, uh, I think it's listed as irrigation line. But again, it's inch and a half diameter. You can see the adapters that I had to use to get it to step down to this rubber hose so that it goes into the pump. And I wanted rubber hose because the pump vibrates a little bit. Um, so I wanted that rubber so that it wasn't vibrating the whole line and all the fittings and everything so terribly. Uh, this is fuel injection line that I picked up at the automotive store, which handles high pressure. Uh, so it can handle the heat and the pressure because this you know, compressed air running through this line um, you know, I don't know if it's transfer from the pump or if it's, it's just the friction of the air going through it. This line gets pretty warm and actually these fittings down here will also get kind of warm too. But this is a half horsepower. Um, I bought this pump as part of a kit. It came with the pump, two sections of weighted airline. They were hundred foot each and the two bottom diffusers for around 600 or 650 bucks on Amazon. And, uh, I'll see if I can uh, I'll see if I can find that listing and I'll insert a picture of it right now. Okay, so I installed that about two years ago. I take these diffusers out every winter. I just don't want them sitting down there at the bottom of the pond getting all full of silt and stuff through the winter. So I I'll pull them out in the winter and replace them in the springtime. Um, you saw the uh, line was coiled up. I just pull the lines out, coil it up, and uh, keep it over there because it's buried partially. Um, so this pump, the uh, sort of the, the only maintenance really that, that I do to it is this is the filter housing. Um, it holds these little bitty cartridge filters. Uh, in the springtime, I'll open that housing up, I'll change the filter out, and when I have that open, I'll squirt a little bit of air, air tool oil in there just to sort of lubricate the cylinders, um, you know, lubricate the rings, cylinders, and then I'll leave this thing run 24 seven all summer long. So I'll plug it in in the spring when the water starts to warm up and then I'll run it 24 seven until I unplug it in the uh, fall when the water cools down. So it plugs into this outlet. This is the only outlet on this circuit. Um, uh, you can see I'm using 10 gauge wire. I wanted to be sure I'm getting plenty of power back here to this pump and it's the only outlet on the circuit so I don't plug other stuff into it to overload this circuit. And it runs all the way up and over to my panel, the only other circuit in this barn is these lights. And I've got them on just now because I'm making this video, but normally I wouldn't even turn them on because I've got these big doors. Typically when I come out here, I just slide the big door open and you know, I'm normally just getting my lawnmower out to mow my grass in the summertime, but I keep other stuff out here that I don't use much. Um, so a lot of months, I, I won't even use the lights, but because these are the only two things, the only two electrical circuits in here, this building has its own uh, electrical meter on the outside and I'm able to very closely monitor how much electrical consumption I have in this building. And that pump is essentially the only electrical consumption out here. So I'm able to very well monitor this. And in a typical summer month, this takes $45 to run. So you can multiply that by, I run it for about five months of the year. I'll plug it in early May into April, something like that. So it'll run May, June, July, August, September. And yeah, normally we're cooling down when we get into October, but I might run it into October. So five, five and a half, six months, something like that. Um, so you figure five times 45, what is that? Uh, $225. So it cost me $225 to run that pump for one year, which is a lot, but it depends on what your goals are for your pond. Now I have, because I've got walleye, yellow perch, those wiper, 
And smallmouth bass in that pond, it's it's sort of critical for me to be circulating a lot of water and keeping the, you know. So the half horsepower pump for what I want out of my pond is right for me. Uh, you might get away with a quarter horsepower, which would draw a little less, uh, might be right for you. But that'll give you an idea of what it costs. Now the pump and kit and everything I think I mentioned was about 600 or 650, something like that when I bought it two, three years ago. So anyhow, I hope I helped you with this one, guys. Give you an idea of what it, it actually what it costs to run these pumps because there's so much misinformation out there. And, you know, I think people are uh, sort of lying to themselves and lying to others to try to hide the fact that you spend a lot of money to aerate your pond. So I hope I helped you with this one. If I did, click that thumbs up button. You want to see more videos, you know, pond related, click the subscribe button. And until the next time, keep on tinkering.